welcome to this session uh, on how to create a learning space in uh, centered in emotional intelligence and here we have with us Suzanne Soshan who is originally from Alaska and have been living in um, Dabo, uh, Daba, Daba, Egypt Daba. for a while yeah and she is here it's all all over to you Suzette thank you welcome welcome everyone um if you do not have a pencil and a piece of paper please get one we will definitely need a piece of paper and a pencil and we will be doing some different interactive things so I hope you're okay with speaking and participating in this little workshop. Um, I really felt called to do this because I feel it's important to bring um, emotional intelligence into whatever area we are working in. So whether it's with kids, whether it's with adults, whether it's just one class a week, whether it's an entire program, whether you run a school, it doesn't really matter because it's so essential. Um, so that's really my intention today is to inspire everybody here to find ways to bring this into whatever avenue you are working. And um, you don't have to be like a superstar in emotional intelligence to start doing this. So that's what my intention is for this. Um, I did want to give a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I am from originally Alaska in the United States. And my life is very bizarre and crazy. And I ended up doing my undergrad way back when in uh, Cairo. Uh, and then I moved back to Seattle. And I was actually training to be an actress. And uh, one day I was sitting in my car and meditating right before work. And I had this huge, I call it a download, because suddenly I was getting all this scenes of what my future was going to be like running a school in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. And I knew it was the Sinai Peninsula because it has a very specific feel here um, in the Sinai. I thought it would be in Nueva, which is a town over and I love Nueva, but it ended up being here in Dahab. And two years ago, of course, life happened. I got married, I had three kids. Um, I didn't think this was, this was just some vision that would never happen because it cannot fit in my very packed, tight schedule in life. Um, but two years ago, we managed to make it happen. And we started a micro school called Luminaire here in Dahab. And we currently have 42 students. We are packed. We have a waiting list. We don't have room unless we build more classrooms. Um, so it's really amazing. And one of the core elements that I knew had to be in the program was emotional intelligence. Um, I am not, I never did training in emotional intelligence. My background is really in the arts and in uh, counseling and more of that type of world. Um, but this is why I, I say how important it is, regardless of your background, how important it is for the kids. Because our school is very, very different. Our teachers constantly are saying how privileged these children are to be getting these skills at this age. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Now I'd like to go around and just ask, and you don't have to go on and on, but why you wanted to join this workshop. So who would like to start? Hi, uh, my name is Haidai, and uh, I'm in Bali, and I've spent the last, I say, six, seven years in doing research, uh, on social emotional learning, uh, specializing in cultural dynamism, like how some of the ancient cultures and indigenous culture, uh, such as the Balinese, uh, how there are integrated social emotional learning in all their rituals, ceremony, and, and daily living, and uh, how the difference it is from, uh, let's say, from a modern culture versus, let's say, a, a, an older culture, and we're slowly moving away from that. So I, I like the idea that uh, you're saying that it can be created space, that you can bring in social emotional learning in, in any space. So um, I, I'm, I'm very interested to hear what you have to share. And uh, that's it. 
Thank you. Who's next? I can go next. Um, uh, go on, we'll go. No, okay. Go, go, go. Okay. So, <laughs> Uh, my name is Katerina, and I actually joined because I had heard about your school uh, when I visited uh, Dahab and also from friends who live in Egypt. So I wanted to know a bit more about uh, the inner workings. Uh, yeah, and uh, also I'm working in education for a long time, not specifically with the children. So anything that uh, comes as an insight from that specific target group is... Uh, um, useful and exciting. Hi, my name is Amor. Uh, I am in Ireland. Um, you know, emotions have always been a huge thing for me. I, I, I grew up in a family that was very angry and I kind of lacked the emotional regulation. And then when I had my daughter, all that conditioning ca came back rushing forth. So I, you know, like I, I have learned uh, coherence, for example, you know, from Hard Math Institute. But then uh, I'm doing unschooling with my daughter and I did try to make her watch the program, you know, to help her out as well. But uh, it kind of doesn't work because, you know, she doesn't want to do it, she doesn't want to do it. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm a bit wrestling with, you know, looking for alternatives on how to do it, obviously modeling, but that's always kind of hard as well. You know, there's all these things happening, isn't it? Uh, you want to do one thing, but then you're not quite exactly modeling the right thing. And then you want them to be self-directed because I'm kind of into kind of unschooling, self-direction, democratic educate, democratic schools. So I'm interested, you know, I, I love all your intro, everything that you said, you know, that you want to start, you have a school and everything. And see how how you did it, you know, how, how that gets integrated in, in a school setting in a kind of self-directed way, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. I think that's all of us for sharing. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. So uh, I will try to, as I speak, um, obviously I'll talk about how I use this in a school setting but also try to add this into some other environments. So a little bit more like if it's just adults, like in a work situation, what you could do one-on-one um, -on -one at home as well, so that it can be more accessible for us. Um, so the first thought is, why do you think emotional intelligence is so important? Um, I will start with why I think it's so important. Uh, where we're going now in the new technological age, whatever you want to call it, um, everything is about our relationship with others, everything. So this Zoom conference is us interacting with each other. If you like me, then perhaps you would buy my product, for an example. Um, if you don't like me, you probably will not buy my product. I don't have a product to sell, by the way, but I'm just using that as an example. Um, so everything as we're moving forward, all business relationships, all, all deals, everything is going to be based on how we communicate with each other. Uh, and the first step to communicating with others is our communication with ourselves. And I think all of us, um, there are people who are born with high emotional intelligence, and that is amazing for them. But I would say that most people, whether you're a child or whether you're an adult or whether you're elderly, um, you don't have a very high intelligence emotionally. We haven't been taught in it. It hasn't been accepted. Um, it's been really the opposite almost that we need to shut down our emotions. There's good emotions, there's bad emotions. So really this is just like a starting page for all of us. Um, so I really like this idea that, you know, you're noticing certain people, scientists, for example, uh, that aren't modeling emotional intelligence, but I would say that every person you interact with probably is on the lower scale when it comes to their emotional abilities in interacting with each other. So this is why it's really, really essential for where we're going uh, in our future and in our life. And we have to start with ourselves, with everything. So to begin with anything, and this is very important. Now, it will be different when you're working one-on-one, -on -one, but any group you have, so even if you're doing a class with your one child at home, 
you have to set a safe environment. This is very, very essential because when we're gonna start doing our emotions, we're very vulnerable. So to contain that, we have to set it up properly. So if you're gonna do emotional intelligence with your kid once a day, if you're gonna do it uh, in a class at the beginning of your class, let's just say you teach English to a group of kids once a week, uh, at the beginning of your class, you're gonna do this. This has to be the foundation. And to start this, we have to have agreements. And those agreements are very simple. They're very different from rules. I'm going to say them now and you will already feel the energy is very different. So the first agreement is respect. And that means we respect ourselves, we respect other students, we respect adults, we respect the space, we respect people's time. Res respect covers so many areas that it's a great agreement to have. So that's the first agreement. The second agreement is honesty. We're honest with ourselves, we're honest with other students and our peers, we're honest with adults or people, our bosses, and we're honest with what the situation is. Uh, the third is kindness. And this is very, very, very important when you're working with emotional intelligence. Kindness is huge. We can say things either in a kind way or a not kind way. So sometimes people will say being direct, I'm being direct and it just is coming across as unkind. That's not true. I'm a very direct, blunt person, but I can either say it in a kind way with a thought, like I care about the person in front of me hearing it, or I can say it in a very mean, mean way. I would say mean. So kindness, and that includes kindness to ourselves. So this is when I started this, I was saying, it doesn't matter if you're a uh, EQ professional or not, be kind with yourself that you even want to do this, that you're even willing to step forward and bring this forth to whichever group or community you're in. So it's kindness towards yourself. It's kindness towards your peers, kindness to, uh, you know, maybe people who are less emotionally intelligent, being kind towards them and how they treat you. And the last one is called growth mindset. And how I use that in a group is that instead of complaining, um, we are trying to solve problems. So if we don't like something, we don't like an activity we're doing, what is the solution? Maybe you have a better idea. How can we change this? So it's a different mindset instead of just like being bickering and complaining about things. So this is an essential um, foundation before starting any EQ work. Because if you don't have this, once someone gets vulnerable, someone else either attacks the vulnerability or you attack your own vulnerability. So you would make fun of yourself for having feelings. So that's how we start. Um, when I used to work, I did a homeschool preschool when I had little kids. So that would be like uh, three and four year olds. And I worked in, uh, I would just teach like a one-off class here and there. Um, when I did corporate workshops, I also used this. And I start the beginning, so starting the school year, starting the beginning of the, the year, starting whatever with these agreements. And I always put them up so everybody has them visualized and then we refer back to them. So that if someone says something mean to someone, we can say, hey, that's not our agreement, we have to be kind together. So that's the basis. Once you have that basis, then you can start doing emotional intelligence. And when you're gonna start this with any group or with your child or with your friends, it's a very slow process. And this is where the kindness and the patience come in. It's a very slow process and you build on it. I'm gonna show you the first thing we do and you guys are gonna to get to have fun with it. I'm going to show you these cards. I wanna show you the size and then I will put the picture up. These are feeling cards, okay? I'm gonna show you some pictures in a minute, but I wanted to give you an idea of the size. It's very similar to a head size. They're just very simple drawings, but I guess you can guess what, what feeling would you guess if you saw this one? Anybody? I'm outrage. Outrage, anger, someone wrote. Um, and this one is actually jealousy. So we have a whole stack of them here. And what I do with the kids every single day, so like I said, when I just would come in for a one-off class, I would spend the first 10 minutes of the class doing the feeling parts. Um, every single day in our school, every single child in the beginning of their, the school day after we do mindfulness, they go to their individual classes with their age group. 
and they do feeling cards. So this is the first step. Uh, before you bring, the kids love these. Adults love these. Everybody loves these. This is Cranky. This is one of my favorite ones. Cranky. Um, before we start that, we have two rules, and these are rules. They're not agreements because they are rules. One is that when someone shares their feeling, we don't talk about it. This is compassion. So we don't talk about it. So if I say I'm feeling compassionate today, nobody says, oh, I am too. Nobody else is saying why. Nobody talks. So we're already teaching whoever you are working with active listening. The second thing is piggybacking. So someone says, I'm happy today. And then it's your turn to share feelings. You don't say, oh, I'm like Suzette. No, you say, I'm happy today. So we're also teaching that my feelings are my feelings, even if they're exactly like someone else's feelings. So I'm going to quickly bring it up. Sorry. I will bring up the photo of this page to show you where it starts. So this is the how do you feel right now? So as you can see, the drawings are very simple and I have taken those and put them onto the big ones that you saw for the easy handling. Um, that is probably the most time consuming thing that, that there is in this part of the project. Um, and then you just write whichever ones you want. Now, I do not have all of these obviously, but I have quite a bit of them. So this is the first beginning. And once you have this, you can start working with it. Uh, so let's go to another picture that will show the ones that I have made. So these are the ones that you would call more positive feelings. Uh, we don't really use those words. We just say we're having a feeling. We don't really label it. We say maybe like uh, a lighter feeling and a heavier feeling because that's again describing it, but we don't describe it as good or bad. If you notice, we also have a variety of colors. This is very important so that they're not associating red as angry, but red could also be excited um, or blue is sad, blue could also be calm. So I mix up the colors. So here you'll see, if we start with the top green, it's focused, I love that one. The purple one next to it is hopeful. The one after that is compassion. Down yellow is happy. Blue in the middle is calm. Uh, the peach colored one is inspired and hopeful. The last one is playful. The orange one is curious. Red is excited. And green is grateful. Okay, and then we have the ones that are heavier emotions. And I have more of those because surprisingly, these ones come up more often. So we have jealous, cranky, frightened, exhausted, also one of my favorite ones, embarrassed, disgusted, frustrated, sad, withdrawn, the black one, disappointed, brown, hopeless, gray, anxious and nervous, the red is angry and sad and shocked. So I'm going to, to leave those up for a second and we are gonna practice, I don't know if I can do both at the same time, let's try. Um, we are going to practice, yep, I have both up at the same time. We're gonna practice this circle. So I will start and then whoever wants to go next can just go next. And we will practice like you would do in whatever group you're in, just to see how your experience is it, of it is, how easy it is for you, how hard it is for you, and to also listen to other people. The other thing is you don't have to share. So you could just say, I'm feeling frustrated and that can be it. You could also say, I'm feeling frustrated because if you want to share. And that, that is the same, whether it's with kids or adults. So everyone has a choice if they want to share why, but it is required in the group to at least share how you're feeling. All right, so I will start. 
I am feeling excited and I am also feeling anxious about time because the time is running. So that is how I am feeling right now. Who would like to go next? I am feeling calm. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I'm feeling really tired and hungry as well. <laughs> okay. Great. Next. I'm feeling inspired. Nice. Thank you. I can go next. Yes. Um, sorry, I can't, um, something happened. Okay. I'm, I am feeling um, a bit overwhelmed because I want to participate in all of the sessions and I'm feeling torn between different things um and at the same time i feeling excited to connect with others nice thank you anyone else i am feeling uh, calm hmm. Happy with how my day is going, so calm about it. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? I I am feeling curious. Mm -hmm. and I'm feeling happy that I will be able to share these with my children at Vision Rainbow. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I feel like hurry and also excited. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, so how can you think that this would be useful? This is the most useful tool to begin with, and it continues on even after EQ professionals. Why do you think this is so important? Any thoughts? To connect. Yes, it's to connect. As a parent or a teacher, how do you think this could be useful? Understand, to understand, to empathize. Yes. Also to put words to things that uh, are important to learn to recognize and to be able to share for a communication to happen. Like finding the link of emotion to word is uh, really helpful. For us, we use this in so many ways. One, as a teacher, or if you're in a building and all the parent, teachers come and tell me, oh, everybody's feeling this way, um, it helps to navigate how you're going to lead that day. So for instance, I'll give an example of uh, two weeks ago in one of the classes, during the sharing time, we start every morning like this. Um, we had one kid who said that over the weekend, their, their dog died. We had another kid that said in the same class, um, that her mother was traveling because her grandma was sick and she was worried about her grandma. We had another kid um, that uh, there was some problem with the family. I think they were getting, I don't know, there were some problems between mom and dad and they were really stressed out about it. And they, you know, of course were imagining the worst that there was gonna be a divorce. So they were going through that. We had another boy who was just missing his father because he hadn't seen him in seven months. And then we had one kid who was like, I'm fine, I'm doing great today. But what helps is if you see all of this is happening in your class, you have a class now that they would not have obviously talked about if we had not done our feeling parts. This would not come up just naturally when you're doing math 
or English or science or social studies or playing on the playground, these conversations don't come up. But since we knew now that in this class specifically today and probably for the rest of the week, um, this is where they're at emotionally, it's definitely not the day to start something challenging. So we're not gonna start a new concept in math like fractions because now they're gonna associate their inability to do the fractions because they're emotionally distraught and having their own stuff going on related to them being bad at math, which is probably not the case at all. It's just that they can't focus today because their mind is somewhere else, their heart is somewhere else. Um, we're not gonna do anything that is uh, like a competitive game, something that would cause like more emotions to come out than usual. So it really helps you to navigate what you're gonna do on a day like that. And so on a day like that, usually it's like, you know what, let's clean our cubbies today. Um, let's review from our, our writing that we were doing last time. Let's review what we already know. Uh, let's do an experiment in science and do something more hands-on and, and um, tactile. So this is how you use these as a teacher or parent to navigate your day. If you have a kid that just woke up anxiety and stressed over something, it's really not the day to then go on a big adventure that day. Um, it does require a lot of flexibility. So teachers or parents or any groups that you're leading, it means that you have to have a really extensive um, set of plans and backup plans because you might have to change your plan for the day. Uh, a lot of my teachers make fun of like, they just learned to flow at our school because we will just change the day completely if we notice it's just not working. So that's the main tool for it. Um, what it really helps in the group is to notice everybody else's feelings to have empathy for them. So for instance, when the boy said, well, I'm feeling great. I'm like, yes, but today is probably not the day that you're going to be doing, you know, jokes that are maybe teasing. I mean, we usually don't do that, but it's not the day you're going to push on your friend's buttons. So he's aware of that. So this is how it helps also to bring the intelligence um, for yourself. It makes you start to realize things. So for instance, when I do this every single day, I notice that I'm pulling the tired car several times in the week. So that's an insight for me as myself that I need to maybe get more sleep, I need to change something. So these are extremely useful. And we start, like I said, I do this before anything else. What you'll need to do with these cards, if you start bringing this into your um, environment, wherever it is, you need to give it like, depending on the group and their emotional intelligence, you need to do this for a good um, one to three months, depending, before you start the next step of emotional intelligence things, which I will get to now. Uh, they really need the space. They need to feel that they can share their feelings in a group and it's accepted. Um, they need to get more vocabulary with their feelings. So we had uh, one kid every single day would always choose the exact same feeling for about an entire month. And what the teacher was saying, is this okay? And yes, it's totally okay. But they really didn't have any vocabulary other than sad and happy. That was their vocabulary of emotions. So it took a while for them to experience different situations and start to put feeling words. And that's why the pictures are helpful as well to describe what they're feeling inside of themselves. We also don't hold on to it. So for instance, if this is sad, you can use it for lonely, you can use it for worried. Children can add their own words, people, adults can use their own words. So it's not so fixated that it has to be this one card and this, this is the only word it can be for, for that. No, it's to express because feelings are really fluid. It's hard to describe them perfectly. So that's the first tool and that's the beginning step. And you can do that in any group, it takes about 10 minutes maximum in the beginning of any group that you have, um, and it really helps you out. So that's the first thing. Any questions about those before I move on to the next thing? Yes, I have a quick question. <clears throat> so I've been actually, and I'm wondering if you have any suggestions because right now I think it's the same happening. We have just maybe like three or four basic stuff, basic things. And so I guess I would like from here to expand it a little bit. But my challenge is how do I explain the feelings, you know, when they introduce, you know, the word of like embarrassed, for example, or like, you know, 
I don't know if there is any sources or even, I mean, I'm not big on like YouTube videos, but I don't know if you suggest any basic things because often, honestly, I'm having a hard time explaining it myself, you know, because this is a learning process for me as well. And he, I mean, we also have three languages going on here. So that's another like layer because I don't know those words in my native language. And so I'm doing this in English, but he is not comfortable as with English as with my native language. But but in any case, if you have any ideas of how to like basic ways of like, you know, explaining feelings or just bringing the vocabulary up. Well, the first thing is, is not to get set at the beginning on the word. So here's embarrassed. Um, so the picture is really there to help, especially with kids. You don't need to explain it so much. I mean, you have the red cheeks, you have the mouth kind of like closed because you're like, you know, this feeling of you want to like, you know, your eyes are small. So the pictures of the faces really help to start. Um, in terms of building vocabulary, if it's not your native language, English, definitely start that exploration in your native language. We have the same situation here with Arabic. And it's really funny because there'll be discussions of what, what is that word? You know, like rage. What is rage exactly? Um, some of them are easier, like disgusted. That's an easy one. So it's really just, these are a great base because then you at least have the picture of this feeling like, you know, so you have the feeling because it is a feeling. It doesn't have to have the actual title of the word to begin with, especially depending on their ages. Um, so I would start with the pictures first, as well as exploring for yourself. What, what, how would you describe it? I know in Arabic, sometimes we have to use two or three words to describe it because it really is like an entire feeling. Hello. Uh, I'll show which, which one are you? You look happy. Let's put happy for you. No, no, that's shock. Oh, you're shocked. I'm shocked. No. Okay. So that's how I would begin uh, if I was in your situation. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So once you have this in place and you feel like at least there's some flow happening, we're doing this like on a regular basis. And it does need to be, like I said, a regular basis once a week, twice a week, every day, whatever your situation is. Um, then we move on to something bigger. And that usually needs about 45 minutes, depending on the group size, depending on their age group, um, depending on what activity is. And then you can start exploring into much deeper, deeper topics. Um, I'm not going to do too deep today, but I will show you what a second stage item we would do. Uh, so this would be something we would do. It can be completely modified for preschool which we've done so for instance we would write for the preschoolers we would ask like what are you good at and this child Zane here if you can see put what his strengths are he said I like to learn like by looking at things um, and so we said okay visual learner uh, he can read will it really well that one he was hard thinking of something we we're like well you're a really good reader and he knows he's smart so those are his strengths um, and then we have here, what am I working on? Following directions. This, of course, you know, needs help from an adult or a peer or something, because like I said, we're still looking at ourselves. It's very hard. But this is the next step. So we've done feelings. Now we're going to kind of look at ourselves. So what are you working on? And we don't say it's a weakness. We don't say it's, a, you know, a problem. No, we say what we're working on because eventually this child can follow directions. Eventually they won't use swear words and eventually they'll make friends. So that's what you're working on. Um, here we have what works for me. And this is very important for a parent or teacher or working in a group. So in a group of teachers, even I need to know what works for the teachers. Um, so this one's patience, humor, visuals uh, that we believe in the person. Praise in me, praise me, routines, fairness. And then we have what doesn't work. Being rushed, sudden changes, negative talk, yelling. So this type of a worksheet, you can bring out at any time. And this is not done in one day. How this works is one day we start for the first 45 minutes and we start talking about 
Strengths, what are strengths? What are people good at? And that's the first thing because people like to talk about what they're good at. We like to think about what we're good at. So we're not afraid to tackle that part. So we start with the strengths. What are we good at? And this is usually starts with a conversation. We have to have ideas. And then depending on the age of the people, you can either do it in one session. Maybe it takes two sessions. So we think of our strengths first. And then we go to the next thing. What works for you? Oh, I like people that have their time and to talk to me slowly and give me time to do things. Okay, I like to laugh. Okay, great. So again, this is something easy. People like to think about what works for me. That's easy. So that could take either a week to do both of those together. Um, maybe in the younger groups, because it's uh, you have to write it for them. It takes a week. It just really depends. But you take your time with it. There's no rush in emotional intelligence. This one is always is hard what you're working on because what they immediately think of is that they're bad at something they're not good so this one needs a lot of setup asking about what you would like to be good at what would you like to be good at what do you think is hard what do you get in trouble for and then we work on what we're working with and that again will take several days depending and then what does not work for me and this is usually they're pretty good at getting this one too. I don't like it when you do this. I don't like it when you do that. I don't like it when suddenly something changes. So that worksheet is an amazing way to start because if you are either in a, in a home or in an environment with people, you can, you put this up on the wall and it's a visual reminder for everybody. So what happens is um, an example of what you do later. First, we put it on the wall. So everybody knows what everybody needs and what they don't need. So now we've taught the kids how to recognize for themselves what works for them. That's huge. I don't even know if many adults know what worked for them. They just explode in your face when it doesn't work. So we're already recognizing what works for us. We're recognizing what doesn't work for us. We're recognizing what we're working on. And we're also giving ourselves some acclimates for what we're really good at. So that's a great first emotional intelligence project to do with them um, or with yourself. I was going to do that with you guys, but I think we're running out of time and it's a bit hard on the, the online situation. Um, so this is a great thing. Then you use this. So you've done this part of the work and now you use it. How we would use this with the older kids that are like eight and they're really excited um, to remind and help teachers is we would give each child one of those things. So for instance, for Zane, um, we would say, Zane, I need you to be in charge of if anybody yells at Mark, you tell us, because that is one of the things that doesn't work for him. So if anybody is yelling at Mark, you're going to be in charge of telling us. So now his focus is one, being empathetic on someone else in the class. And two, he feels important. He has a job. And so it's also recognized that this is not acceptable because it doesn't work for one person. So we're already changing the mentality that our entire group is important. Everybody's needs are important. Everybody is valuable. We've already changed it just by doing that very small little thing. Um, and then, you know, uh, Ella's job is that when someone uh, is not patient with Mark, she's going to say, oh, but that person is, not they're not being patient with Mark. And again, this can take the a long time. So you'd focus an entire week just noticing in the environment when someone is doing something that doesn't work for somebody in the class. So now we're changing the rhythm already of the class. So that's how we can use that. And then we have millions of millions of, and you can research anywhere on any website, um, giraffe stories these are from the tribes curriculum and it shows you what grade it works for how much time it takes uh shows you what the objectives are how to do it and so like i said we do things like this with our teachers they're not trained in emotional intelligence but we have it here straightforward what to do and like i said this is from the tribes curriculum um 
Here's another one on self-esteem, and this is a bit older. So this is grades three to adults. So we wouldn't be doing this with the preschoolers because it would be too difficult to manage. It would need a lot of uh, changing around, which is, sometimes we change a lot of things around. Again, this is from the tribe's curriculum. Uh, we did an entire unit on nonviolent communication. We did the draft books for nonviolent communication. So there's lots and lots of tools out there, but that's the next step. That's after we've gotten our feelings. We've started to look a little bit at ourselves. That's why that first page is really great, just to do this very simple, basic thing of what I like about myself, what I don't, what I need, what I don't. Um, and then we move on. So that's how the EQ works in our world. Uh, the other things we do, which is essential, and we're going to do that now, birthdays. So we really honor everybody's birth. We have a big celebration. We do the Waldorf ceremony. I don't know if you know it. Um, but uh, you take like a light or a sun in the middle and the kids go around it as many times as they have gone around the sun. So that's the sun, they go around it. And then after that, this is the part we've added with emotional intelligence is that we all sit in a circle and we share why we're so happy this person has been born. And like I said, we have to get to a certain level where the kids can actually say things about each other that's kind. And we pro it was pretty fast in our school because we have cake at the end of the day. So it was part of the ceremony of like, this is the part we do for them. And then they're bringing cake at the end of the day. So we all need to say nice things about each other. So what we do is we go around in a circle and we share why we're so happy they're born. And it can be really simple. Like it could, the kids could say, uh, because you're really kind, because you play good football, uh, because you always let me get in line before you. And that makes the child glow. One, they're very happy. They learn to take compliments and they learn to see how important they are just by being. So they didn't do anything. They're just sitting there in the circle on their birthday and they get acclimated for just being themselves. And then at the very end, and this is always the hardest part, they share why they were glad they were born. And sometimes, I mean, even now we're going on two years. So, okay, it's their second birthday, I guess. But it's hard for them to think of what they're good at, why they're, why they're so great that they were born. What is something that they're bringing to the world? And I always tell them, adults also can't tell you very easily what they're great at, why they're here. So we will give examples. We'll say, well, lots of people said you're kind. Do you think you're kind? And then they usually think of something totally different. So now they're starting to also realize that they're valuable and they're able to compliment themselves and see that they're important. So that's another thing we add um, to, the, to the school day. We have birthdays, it feels like every day. Um, and the last thing that we do um, besides EQ, so in our, in our program, I mean, if you're lucky enough to run a program, we have 45 minutes every single day for EQ. It's the first thing, it's the most important thing in my mind. So we do that before we do any academics. Um, but if not, I used to do these in my classes, like I said, and with preschoolers. Um, we end every single day with gratitude. That's the other thing we always do. So if you're at home with kids, you can end the day with gratitude. We also do that at home. But since we do it at school, the kids are always like, I already did it at school, but it's, a, it's very important. Um, just to think of one thing you're grateful for. And it doesn't have to be related to school. It doesn't have to be related to the house. It can just be anything you're truly, truly grateful for. So we end every day grateful for something. Yes, and I can also, uh, yeah, mention the ones we've used, but really um, sometimes we even create our own. So we were noticing we had a lot of problems with the compet competitive games on the playground. So we just pulled all kinds of resources about cooperative games and competitive games, and we created our own type of thing. Um, that's why I really think it's important not to let your knowledge get in the way. You know, now with the internet, there's so much knowledge out there. Just take on whatever it is you need and just do it the best you can. That would be my advice. Anything is better than nothing. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything you do with the kids, even if it's not perfect, um, is better than nothing. I mean, you guys know the saying, right? The only perfect parents are the ones that don't have kids. So 
<laughs> so anything is great and it works for adults because all adults are basically in our children as well. They, they, they don't have the emotional intelligence either. So it's all good. All right. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Good luck on your adventures into emotional intelligence. I wish you well. And if you ever come to Dahab, Egypt, you can find us, our little world here. 